was four when uh, my mother took my younger sister and I on a life-defining boat journey. We left behind, um, you know, our, our, our roots, um, the country of our birth, and uh, we searched for a better future. We left everything that we knew, everything that was known and familiar, and ventured into the unknown, not knowing where we were going or where we would end up. We were actually one of the lucky ones. After five days and nights at sea, we were rescued by a British oil tanker just off the coast of Malaysia and taken into a refugee camp while we waited for a country that would take us in and give us a chance at a new life. Australia actually opened her arms to us and uh, in December 1981, we arrived in Melbourne grateful, open and ready to start a better life. Well, as with any new immigrant story, once you arrive in your new country, learning the new language is critical. So there was a lot of pressure on us to learn English as quickly as possible. In fact, even my grandmother, aunt and uncle suggested that we quickly abandon speaking our mother tongue and uh, in an attempt to embrace, fully embrace and master our new language. Well, my mother, she wouldn't have any of it. She insisted that we could speak English at school, but the moment we arrived home, we had to speak Vietnamese. My family would also learn English, but they would speak in Vietnamese to my younger sister and I. What good fortune that was to have been exposed to both languages throughout our childhood. We both grew up bilingual, fluent in both languages, and in fact were able to think and even dream in both. What my mother didn't realize, however, was that studies in the brain actually showed that a child's brain goes through a period called of critical, uh, a critical period, basically a window of time in which the brain is especially plastic and sensitive to the environment, and during which it undergoes rapid formative growth. Um, and in fact, different neural systems have their own critical period. Language development, as it turns out, has a critical period that begins in infancy and ends sometime between the ages of eight and puberty. After this critical period closes, a person's ability to learn a new language or a second language without an accent is actually considerably limited. In fact, second languages learned after the critical period are not processed in the same part of the brain. And obviously, it's possible for older children and adults to learn languages after the critical period, but they just have to pay attention and uh, work at it. So brain imaging was providing this incredible insight into the process of learning. Technological advancements in recent years have provided more brain imaging options, enabling us to now see these images in real time and at much higher resolutions, offering increasingly better systems for studying the structure, function, and wiring of our brain. EEG measurements are among the most promising neurotechnology solutions because of their non-invasive nature, potential low cost, and ease of use. And for those of you who may not already be familiar with EEG, when the neurons in our brain interact, the chemical reaction emits an electrical impulse which can be measured. EEG, or electroencephalography, is the process of observing brain waves, essentially changes in electrical fluctuations that can be observed at the scalp, which result from neurons firing. What if it was possible uh, to find an affordable way in which we can offer every child a brain-based assessment so that we could tailor programs um, to strengthen essential areas while neuroplasticity is greatest? When we first started working in this space, you know, we quickly realized that the task wasn't easy. Machines available to uh, image and measure and observe the brain were cumbersome, time-consuming to use, and cost-prohibitive. 
Conventional EEG measurements typically involve a hairnet with an array of sensors like the image that you see behind me. A technician will place the electrodes onto the scalp using a conductive gel or paste, and generally after a procedure of preparing the scalp by light abrasion. So as you can imagine, it's not the most comfortable process. It's quite time consuming. And on top of that, these systems costs in the tens of thousands of dollars. Furthermore, our brain may weigh just three pounds, but it's one of the most advanced organs in our body. It contains an estimated 100 billion nerve cells called neurons and many more support cells. So there is significant challenges in developing computational algorithms to decipher the complex electrical fluctuations that can be observed at the scalp. By assembling a multidisciplinary team uh, and also utilizing the availability of exponentially growing and converging technologies, we were able to develop and bring to market a really innovative EEG system. And with that, I'd like to invite on stage David, who I met uh, here at this conference, and uh, he's gonna help me to showcase what we've been able to develop. So the device you see here is a uh, multi-channel, high-fidelity EEG acquisition system. It doesn't require any conductive gel or paste, and if you can switch over, please, to the, to the other image. It doesn't require any conductive gel or paste. Uh, no specialist knowledge is required from the user. It uh, takes a few minutes to put on and for the signals to settle. It's also wireless, so you're not strapped uh, to the, uh, if, if anyone has taken an EEG reading before, you'd be strapped pretty much to uh, the hospital environment, uh, whereas here David's able to roam around. What you're seeing here now uh, is an, a live stream of uh, David's brainwave as he's standing here. Uh, yeah, so very quickly, uh, each of those traces represent one of the sensors on his head. And I should also mention that this system um, costs you know, is a hundred times cheaper than a conventional EEG system. Here's another um, way to look at what's going on in David's brain. So it's separated into different uh, frequency dimensions. Red means there's a lot of activity. Blue, deep blue means there's not a lot of activity in those particular regions. And uh, you know, you can see as he's trying to imagine different things. Uh, we're talking about him, he's getting more excited. So, you know, it changes in real time based on, on what's going on. So now what I'd like to show is something that we've developed. You know, what, what the idea is when we first developed this technology is to really mirror more closely the way that humans interact with each other. So we can now detect facial expressions, emotional experience, and cognitive intent. We don't have a lot of time, so we're just gonna show one uh, aspect of this, which is cognitive intent. And the idea here is that I'm gonna add a user. So David, what's your last name? Vig? Vigamont with a W. Oh, okay. Like that? Yep. Okay, and we've just lost wireless. So if you didn't. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to just um, get closer to that for a tick? Okay, perfect. Live demos, you know? What can you do? So, okay, we, we're, go we're good. So now what I'd like to do is you begin by starting to train a neutral signal. So every person's brain is very different from the next, and so what we want to do is start by observing and taking a quick snapshot of what the brain looks like when David's just hanging out and being himself, not doing anything in particular, and that's just a neutral state. Now that we've done that, David, choose an action that you think you can visualize with your mind. Pool. Pool? Okay. So now what you want to do, and we've just, there we go, thank you. All right, so we've repaired. So with Paul, what you want to do is, unlike the other time, you, you want to really imagine and focus all your energy and attention to imagining pulling that cube towards you. The first time nothing happens because the system has no idea how you think about that action. Um, and you just want to keep that thought constant the whole time. So ready, set, go. Okay, so now that you've done it, let's see if the machine can respond. 
Oh, very good. Very good focused attention. An interesting note um, to point out is that for adults, a lot of us want to preserve plasticity. And one of the key, well, you're just showing off now. <laughs> what, you know, a key ingredient in being able to preserve plasticity in adults is to learn new, undertake new learning activities that really requires a focused attention. So anything that requires you to, to really focus intently is going to help stimulate the production of neurotransmitters that will help, um, you know, very have really beneficial effects in keeping cognitive decline at bay. So, you know, these sorts of brain exercises are actually pretty fun and uh, also uh, helped to uh, stimulate some uh, very focused attention. Wow, that's really good. I'm impressed. Should we try another? Yeah, let's try one more. We have a bit of time, yes. Let's choose another action. Disappear, okay. <laughs> okay, so this one's actually quite a hard one. So with disappear, there's no analogies for this in our physical world. And so it's harder to imagine. You're really trying to evoke an, an idea in your mind. So imagine the cube slowly fading away. Okay, so now that it has an idea of how you do it, let's see if you can. Oh, wow. He's so good. Fantastic. So we also want to showcase, if you're going to change to the, the free game as well. So um, when Walter approached me to talk at TEDx Kids, you know, we had never really created anything, especially for kids. And uh, we decided that we would create something that we would be able to showcase a world premiere at this event. So... Um, David's going to help me load up a game that uh, is, is designed for kids to be showcased here and it's controlled c exclusively with the headset. So the idea is that you can fly around a really beautiful world uh, just using the headset. <laughs> And we just sh show a little bit because, you know, the kids will be able to try and play this. And any adults, if you'd like to try the headset while you're here, you're most welcome to as well. So no keyboards, no mouse, just the headset. Yes, why is huh? <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, thank you, David. I better grab my monitor again. Good job, thank you so much. So we, we're showing um, learning and, and in the context of a game because what studies have shown is that, if we can switch back to my slides please, is that um, reward actually secretes neurotransmitters which are crucial to learning. Obviously, as you can imagine, there are many possible application areas for this new technology. And as I mentioned before, when we first embarked on this research, we um, were constrained by the lack of equipment to reliably and efficiently measure and image the brain. But it was very clear to us that there are teams of smart and talented people worldwide who can help to further the research and understanding into the human brain. So today, our model is to foster innovation by making the technology available to developers and researchers worldwide so that they can uh, extend and expand where the technology can go from here. And in the several minutes remaining, I'd like to show you just a few examples of what we've seen developed within our developer community. So the first is creation of art using the brain. Using an EEG device, we observe the collection of brain synapse firing pattern, your brain begins pouring out data to create the artwork. The observed imagery is based on your color palette coupled with your thought patterns and emotions as they determine what will appear. 
the resulting artwork is a direct impression of you. How you felt. How you were thinking. And how you generally interacted with the imagery on the fly. So every 10 seconds, we capture the current visual state. So when you're finished brain painting, you can see your entire session and choose the moment that you feel best represents you. Another really exciting application area is what we're seeing in market research and advertising. By understanding how the brain actually responds to certain stimuli, you can extrapolate from that information to determine whether a product, a brand, an advertisement is having the desired effect. So what you're seeing here are um, orange dots which represent where your eyes are looking and you can also see how the brain is responding to that visual stimuli and the graphs to the right of that are showing the emotional responses. We can obviously also apply this to some really life-changing applications as well. In this case, the facial expressions are mapped to movement commands to control this electric wheelchair. Now blink right to go right. Now blink left, turn back left. Now smile to go straight. And uh, I also wanted to show you a preview of um, what might be possible in the not so distant future. We trained the computer to recognize four brain patterns. The test subject can steer the car to the left or the right. He can also accelerate or decelerate the car. Of course, you should never try this at home. For safety reasons, we tested in a large open space at Tempelhof Airport in Berlin. You can see here the test subject incrementing or decrementing the steering angle. There's a slight delay between the brain command and the steering action. Remember, this is just a proof of concept. The task here was to show free driving by detecting brain patterns. We're really only scratching the surface of what is possible with this technology today. By now being able to easily, reliably and affordably measure and image the brain, we open up a whole new horizon in terms of what might be possible over the next decade with systems, processes and new industries around a better understanding of our brain. I think the, the potential for this technology is really exciting. So thank you very much.